Welcome to the AI Cafe today with my great speakers Ruben Cano from ICT IP Associate at Baker McKenzie and Carlos Munoz, Tech and Regulatory Affairs Council at Hugging Face. So I'm very happy you're there. Hi, 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 Carlos. Hi, hi, Ruben. Yeah, yeah, our communication works great. So uh, today the talk will be about legal approach to AI licensing dynamics. I myself, I'm the moderator and organizer. My name is Carl McWilliams from Grassroot Arts in Cologne. And I'm also a partner in the research project AI for Media. Please take notice, that's always the regulations we have for the recordings, that the session will be recorded. So, no confidential information shall be shared in this cafe. In this cafe, the speakers, including me, express their personal view and opinions. This is not necessarily the official AI for Media project opinion. Uh, so, everybody here is allowed to say what they want and what is this a cafe about most important it is about knowledge sharing gain insight in the european ai scene you have the chance to network and get in contact with stakeholders from various areas of ai research that's why we're here so um, if you want after the cafe to network it's up to you and do it direct. And that's why we need your questions. Please send us your questions. You cannot talk. I know all participants um, who are now joining, please send us your questions over the chat and question channel. You will see it on your right side in the menu. Uh, at the end of this presentation, of the presentations of the speakers today, we, I, no, we will address your questions. I will read them to the speakers. So that's really important. Please be interactive, active. Tell us your questions. I see people coming in. And now I want to introduce the speakers. First, Ruben Kano. He's uh, IPICT Associate of Baker McKenzie. He's based in Madrid and works as an intellectual property information and communication technology associate for Baker McKenzie. He studied law and business administration at the University of Alicante and Pantheon Sorbonne University and holds an LLM in intellectual property and information technology by the University of Alicante and an LLM <laughs> um, in law of internet technology by Bocconi University. Apart from working as a lawyer, he has worked as privacy by design legal expert for different institutions. Is AI responsible for cyber laws and participates as a legal expert in different projects related to AI regulation? Hi, Ruben, this is great <laughs> that you're here. Thank you. And on my other side is the speaker, Carlos Munoz. He is Tekken Regularity Affairs Council at Hugging Face. Uh, Carlos is Tekken Regularity Affair Consultant. He has been a, a consultant also for the OECD on AI governance and regulatory experimentation, where he continues to serve on OECD network of experts on AI. He was previously a PhD researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition, focusing on the interaction between open source and standards from an IP and competition law angle. Carlos is now a days driving the efforts for the adoption of responsible AI licenses he previously drove the licensing efforts of Big Science to release a multilingual large language model and currently drive licensing at Big Code. So very impressive. Thank you. You're here. Hi, Carlos. Hi. 
And also I see that our participants are joining and great, you are all here again. Please send us your questions to the two speakers. It is really important as it gets rather boring here in the cafe. And so therefore send us your questions, we need them. And now I give the moderation over to Ruben, uh, because they both, Ruben and Carlos, will now make their talk, which we are waiting for. <laughs> so I call Ruben as the moderator. Great. Fantastic. I, see you. I hope you can see me now. Now it's full yes. screen. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Carmen, for the kind introduction. Um, now we can only deceive the audience. So um, I don't know whether that has been positive or, or, or negative at all. But thanks, thanks again for your uh, for your very um, um, for your extreme kindness, and and it's, it's nice uh, always to be here in this in this forum. Um, today I see I'm, yeah. only my 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 uh presentation yeah yeah some... yeah, be, yeah because yeah. Uh, the, we have okay. the, the next the next slide is uh, okay yeah <laughs> and um well as i was as i was saying it's it's always nice to to be here today with a with a esteemed colleague and, and friend carlos um we will play a game of questions and answers so that um um, we kind of set some basis with regards to AI licensing dynamics and and in particular we focus on which are the open licensing trends uh, in the in this space so um, in when with without further ado um, please Carlos say whatever you want to say um, and uh, otherwise I will ask you in, which is the context in we, which we are we are um, living now. I mean, where are we coming from when we speak about open licensing? How can we understand that uh, and which is the role it's playing today? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ruben. And thanks a lot also again, Carmen, for, for the kind invitation. Hi, everyone. Carlos, um, so yeah, I think uh, the topic of uh, open uh, licensing within the AI sector is a very, not just interesting, but also timely one. I remember, um, yeah, more or less one year ago when I was uh, still a researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition, I was writing a paper with a colleague of mine, with Marta Duque Lizarralde, and the paper basically was about a strategic uh, use of open source licenses within uh, AI platforms and why. So basically we carried a study and we chose more or less 60 uh, AI related open source uh, projects and we realized that uh, among the 60, more than 90% of these projects were using a permissive open source license and just a marginal uh, number of projects were using a more restrictive. Uh, open source license, right? At the same time, uh, the main big tech companies nowadays uh, are both using open source licenses, so they are licensing a lot of AI related features on an open source basis, but at the same time, these are uh, prominently the biggest patent holders when it comes to AI related patents. So it's very interesting to see how uh, these dynamics within the context of AI are starting to play. Because if we think about patents, we think about this kind of more, from a traditional intellectual property perspective, this kind of exclusive uh, mechanism designed to exclude competitors uh, in the market. If you think about open source licenses, open source licenses are standard uh, licensing templates designed to enable open royalty free access, modification, use, distribution, or even redistribution of the material uh, licensed under this license, either an open source license, open source according to the open source definition given by the open source initiative, or even what we know as a creative commons license for broadly uh, internet generated or digital uh, generated content such as videos, images, blog posts, etc. etc. Now, uh, what uh, role uh, do these licenses play within uh, the AI field? When we use an open source license, 
um, or when we use a Creative Commons license for AI, to license AI, what do we mean by it? What do I mean when I say I open source my AI? In fact, uh, you have to take a more, let's say, component-based approach, right? What are you uh, as a licensor licensing? Are you licensing source code related to AI applications, related to uh, model training, for instance? Are you licensing the machine learning model? Are you licensing a training data set? And therefore, depending on the tool you are licensing, you might ask yourself, and why am I licensing this? Or why do I want to license this under an open source license? So a license traditionally or originally designed to license a source code, basically. Or why uh, do I want to use a Creative Commons license to license a pre-trained model or a machine learning application? So these are the questions that we are nowadays asking ourselves within the AI sector. There's no set of standardized and super common um, set of open AI licenses for the moment being. For sure, these are going to come because we are in a real need. We are seeing more and more how companies use what we have already there on an open basis. So what we already know, open source licenses, for instance, or Creative Commons to share the uh, AI features they have been developing, such as either training data sets, or as I was saying, pre-trained models, or source code, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because as, as a matter of fact, um, assuming that the AI is protected under um, intellectual property, it, it, it goes without saying that we have different ways to, let's say, distribute those um, a systems or as you were mentioning the components or the the the, um, the features that we are kind of um, um, selecting because as a matter of fact the a system or the ai as such um, introduces different components or different elements different features that integrate it all together or even not always together uh, make possible the AI artifact, AI system or AI uh, whatever uh, uh, to, to, to be used, no, it's, it's, it's just that way. But we have, um, I, I totally agree with you. And in this context, uh, I would say we have two main, um, let's say schools of, uh, licensing, so to speak, the traditional one, uh, which follows more like a a, um, a top bottom approach, meaning this the the manner that proprietary proprietary software is is being distributed nowadays, meaning I'm I develop, I create, I train, and I put into the market, and Machine, machine learning model, and I'm the one, let's say, proposing the terms. And the terms are negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, which is, let's say, less um, dynamic as the open source ecosystem. Um, maybe it's more tailored, and it, that's why some uh, some companies prefer it, and also involves additional elements, such as um, sometimes a service level agreement, maintenance agreements, um, and let's say ancillary uh, um, services that are provided together with, 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 the, um, with the model as such. Because oftentimes what happens, and Carl will explain it 100 times better than myself, um, with open source, uh, or open licenses uh, related to AI models uh, is that we, because of 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 a need, we exclude some component components or we exclude some part of the of the elements that we need to operate uh, the the AI uh, artifact. And what happens with that? Let's say I, w I wouldn't call it traditional, but tailored uh, or proprietary uh, in, in origin uh, licenses uh, is that oftentimes they kind of foresee the whole thing. They foresee uh, what has to be done with the underlying software, 
with the AI model uh, and the underlying software connected to it, with data as well, uh, whether the data has to have certain level of quality um, or not, um, which are the, um, the, the um, as I was mentioning, the uh, maintenance tasks that the developer and the provider such has to support the client with. Um, and it, it sometimes involves kind of a client uh, a, a company approach. It's not the developer, um, develop to develop, dev dev approach that oftentimes I'm afraid is, is followed in the, in the open uh, ecosystem. So I think that it is, as in the intellectual property ecosystem as such, there is these two say schools schools of of uh, thinking or of of to proceed in in um, uh, wherein on the one hand we have the um, everything is closed and keeps closed and you can do what I'm telling you to do and the second one which which says okay you can do this and maybe your work and your contribution will redound in a um, more open space and in a in a in a let's say in a result that can be further implemented by third parties um, and uh, this is kind of the the two the two uh, approaches. I, I believe that the open uh, approach, the open source approach, actually responds to a market need. Um, of people that cannot, let's say, uh, afford some type of technology or that need those, that technology in a, in a more flexible way, in a more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, rapid way. But um, every type of, of, uh, of approach will depend also on the, on the type of the company, the developer, uh, the protectability also of the of the of the outcome or of the of the underlying software that is being uh, not only the software but also data and and so on uh, and we have to be kind of decided on a case by case basis. So I don't know whether you want to to add something, Carlos, on on this. Yeah, thanks, Ruben. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, I totally agree with um, with you. Uh, basically, what uh, uh, I remember I was reading one uh, open source related book for my thesis once, and, and basically the uh, the author was tagging open source as enabling frictionless uh, distribution. Um, so you don't have, as you were saying, this kind of traditional one-to-one -one, uh, negotiation approach, which uh, might entail for the license run, the licensee transaction cost and time investment. Um, you know that you have an open feature or a feature out there in a platform in an open repository and you can access and use it on a royalty free basis and even uh, benefit from some prerogatives such as modification and redistribution of, um, of this material. What is very interesting to take a look uh, within the AI sector is that the AI sector has been influenced by software or dynamics within uh, traditional software uh, markets with the uses of open source. Open source related innovation is nowadays or plays nowadays a huge role within uh, the AI ecosystem. Uh, when we think about releasing components on an open basis, we think that we are releasing components on the top of the value chain because the top or let's say like this on the top of the innovation stream because the top of the innovation stream is where open source normally might happen. You release the training data set, you release a pre-trained model. What is it the top? Because then downstreams, users are going to use this openly available pre-trained model, fine tune the model, embed it within an application, and suddenly you come up with a machine learning application, which you are going to license or sell or normally distribute it as a software as a service for the end customer, at the bottom of uh, the innovation stream, but also value chain, right? The thing is that nowadays, uh, innovation related practices within the AI sector are deeply uh, influenced by open source dynamics and therefore um, stakeholders use a lot uh, open source or creative commons licenses to release 
some specific AI features such as data sets or even pre-trained models that are something technically different to uh, the traditional conception of software or let's be more precise, source code. That's um, that's great. I I I fully agree. Um, now that we have kind of the the context of what can be done and uh, the let's say on the one hand the negotiation um, more classical approach to um, licensing um, and the open source licensing. At the end of the day, we are always speaking about contract agreements whereby we are kind of allowing third parties to use something that is protected. Um, I wanted to ask you some questions um, and, and kind of launch the discussion about several points regarding to, um, to, um, to the licenses that you are hanging face as a kind of open source uh, AI related project uh, are, are handling um, and um, maybe we can exchange some comments on that uh, and that will help also the, the audience to understand which are the relevance of, of, the, of the matter. So the first one is, the, yeah, tell me. Oh no, thank you. Yeah, I, I wasn't realizing you already, you were going to introduce the, the question. Yeah, so, so I think um, the AI or machine learning specific uh, licenses stemmed, or at least from my personal experience, uh, from big science. Uh, big science was an open and collaborative uh, innovation project um, led or promoted by Hugging Face and also thanks uh, to uh, the grant of two public French research agencies, CNRS and jean -Z, to use their supercomputing infrastructure to train a multilingual uh, 176 billion parameters large language model. Um, and at this point, uh, I remember I was uh, co-leading the, the legal and ethical task force or working group, and we were asking ourselves, how are we going to license this? And the first uh, answer was, well, let's open source it, right? Let's use uh, an already available official open source license uh, according to the open source or en endorsed by the open source initiative according to their definition. So officially an open source license permissive one such as an apache 2.0 for those of you who don't know the main difference between permissive and restrictive open source licenses basically a permissive open source license the most well known are apache 2.0 mit or bsd allows you to do almost whatever you want uh, with uh, with the released uh, source code or the licensed source code um contrary wise a restrictive open source license is normally the main or GPL uh, family. A GPL license includes a very specific uh, clause or provision called copyleft. So basically when you are using the license, the source code, you are modifying it or embedding it into one of their products and then therefore you are releasing again, distributing this software product or the modified version of the originally licensed software you have to distribute it under the same license, so the GPL, right? This is why we call or we tag them as restrictive um, licenses. So we were discussing about placing a permissive license. Uh, at the same time, we thought, okay, one moment. First of all, from a technical perspective, why are we going to use a license design for source code to license software for a pre-trained pre -train machine learning model? for something that is not source code, even though it is embedded within source code when distributed on a commercial basis or as we call a machine learning application, or nowadays we like to uh, tag under the AI, act as a AI system, right? From a very component or, or granular and modular uh, perspective, what we were dealing with was just the machine learning model, right? A set of weights, parameters, model infrastructure or architecture, sorry. Um, we were concerned about releasing this on an just on an open basis without placing some specific use restriction uh, restrictions. This was also due and informed uh, by the model card of the model that we developed. So a documentation explaining, describing to the user how uh, or what's uh, this feature, how does it work, 
the testing we made for the feature, but also uh, their technical, the features, technical capabilities and technical limitations of the model. Informed by the technical capabilities and technical limitations of the model, and also taking, in our case, a big science community approach uh, to the matter, we decided to place some use restrictions. So we decided to come up with some kind of new license in this space, uh, a license specifically devoted for a machine learning model, first time, uh, and also a license trying to strike a balance between open access, so open innovation, releasing on an open basis this AI feature, and at the same time, striking this balance between open innovation and responsible innovation. So setting a set of use restrictions due to the fact that we were concerned that the model could be used for, for instance, to provide medical advice or medical results interpretation when the model was not specifically fine-tuned for this specific task, right? So this is one of uh, the main uh, responses nowadays to this kind of AI uh, licensing economy, what we call responsible uh, AI license or open and responsible AI license. We always say the same thing. First of all, these are not open source licenses according to the open source definition. These are just another type of open licensing dynamics as Creative Commons are a different set of licenses to uh, open source um, official licenses, right? So these are a different type of license and also these are not the main silver bullet. These are not the answer to every single concern dealing with how uh, stakeholders might use or misuse uh, your openly uh, distributed AI system. I mean, software piracy or misuse of some specific uh, release software features have been happening since already. I mean, it's it's the matter. It's the bread and butter. It, it has nothing even to do with proprietary or open license. If someone wants really to misuse the software or to misuse the AI system, it is going to. Basically, the responsible AI license. It's another governance tool stemming towards this kind of adoption of some kind of responsible culture when openly sharing uh, AI features or even commercializing them also. Mm -hmm. I, I believe I believe you partially um, answered to that to that question um, into the question I'm I'm just uh, sharing the screen, but maybe for the for the audience to to, to have it crystal clear, uh, what are the the AI features that yeah. are being are being licensed on an open basis? Yeah, I basically kept going just with uh, more context and background for uh, for the for the audience to understand a bit why uh, are we proposing this type of licenses. Yeah, so basically, uh, Ray licenses, and by the way, you can access uh, Ray licenses, the existing one, uh, and also the upcoming work within uh, the webpage of the Rail initiative. Um, Ray licenses could be designed for to license every single tool. So if you want to license some pre-trained models, if you want to license a data set, if you want to license some source code or machine learning application, you can use a responsible AI license. In our specific case, we were licensing a pre-trained model plus also the source code needed to uh, run the model, for instance, right? Something that uh, it is already available out there, just the source code on an open uh, source basis. So, you know, I mean, there was no point for us to place some use restrictions when you can already uh, take the source code uh, out there on an, op on an Apache or MIT uh, basis. So again, uh, on this case, we were licensing a pre-trained model. You can use a responsible AI license to license also the data set, to license also uh, an entire machine learning application, as you wish. Okay, I'm um, what I what I've seen, um, for instance, in the in the license of the pre-trained model, um, uh, you are, as you rightly point out, um, you are licensing licensing the machine machine learning model, so you exclude, for instance, data related to to the model, which has to be, um, um. Let's say licensed by a third party or the 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 one that is is, is own, owns any rights over data. How's how's that how's it possible? Doesn't that doesn't that produce some kind of um, lock in or or the 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 inability to to use or to train the the AI system without 
uh, going to the data owner and, and saying, hi, I have, I, I have this, I have the, the, the license uh, to use the pre-trained model, uh, but um, I, need the, I need data to do it, um, or I need data to validate something or to fine tune something or to understand, to do some reverse engineering thing to understand how the, um, I don't know, the model was adjusted or was fine tuned. How do you see that? Yeah. Uh, so in our case, um, I think it's something um, sometimes it might be a common practice to release the pre-trained model and not the training data set. Uh, in our case, uh, we decided also to release basically or to inform the users about what we call the data corpus. So basically the set of data sources we used um, as the training uh, data set or to create a training data set for this model. So it's openly available uh, out there is basically the roots uh, corpus of uh, data. Um, it's, uh, we are already also taking a similar approach for a new project. We are, um, we are actually developing called Big Code. Uh, Big Code, it's also an open uh, collaboration project where we are training a large, where we are developing a large language model for code generation purposes. So to train a this large language model, the main training or the training data set is composed of source code, of code repos, right? Um, now, what we decided to do is to take an open approach since the very beginning to the open to the data set. So we openly released um, this data set, specifically stating that uh, users of the data set should be aware of each of uh, the licenses within uh, or the repositories within composing uh, the training data set. Why? Because the training data set was, is just composed of uh, uh, source code repos licensed under permissive open source licenses. So basically you can do whatever you want with uh, the source code. However, this does not mean that the license might include some type of requirements for the user, such as uh, to provide attribution to provide license notice when you are distributing uh, the, the source code, right? So basically what we are trying to deal right now uh, from a more, let's say, governance approach, not just licensing perspective, is how do we create some kind of a governance interface between the AI community and the open source community. And for this, we develop the tool, basically for software developers to check whether their source code that they release on an open source basis was within uh, the data set, and if they wish so, if they wish so, they can opt out from the data set. So basically, they can extract and uh, their source code from the data set not to be used, right? Uh, well, they can extract. We are going to delete it, right? So this is some kind of a governance uh, approach to the topic. The other one is on the output phase of the model. So again, with the data, uh, if uh, I am writing. Uh, and suddenly I am using uh, this model to help me uh, writing some, uh, some, some scripts, uh, and suddenly I get some code snippets uh, provided by the model, and I, know where, I don't know where these code snippets are coming from. Maybe these code snippets are part of a source repo under an open source license, right? and I have to respect this open source license. For the moment being, what we can do is that when the model splits or outputs uh, an entire uh, source code repository, we can, or we are able to trace the origin and therefore the license and the attribution of this one. We are already, uh, we are nowadays focusing on developing more specific tooling for specific snippets and not when the model outputs the entire, um, let's say, code repository. Mm -hmm. So I mean, from my understanding of, of, um, of the models and, and the the operation of open source in in this ecosystem, what I understand is that actually is not um, what is being late license is not comprehensive. Meaning that um, those licenses or open source in machine in machine learning models, but may not apply uh, or may not include other elements necessary in order to operate through the model or to train the model or whatever it is. Um, so then maybe this is also a, a huge difference um, 
um, from what I've seen in the, let's say, classical approach, whenever you uh, want to distribute something, you actually, it's, some, it's something kind of ready to use uh, or ready to implement. It's, it's not that we have a plethora of, uh, of licenses regarding um, uh, of our documents regarding data or regarding the, the model, regarding whatever it is. Uh, we have one document that maybe includes 150 licenses depending on the feature or the uh, element we are um, kind of uh, are included in the in the system, but um, there is no um, kind of that differentiation. Also, because as I understand it, it is very complex to uh, do some. I mean, to to um, to write down some standard terms or some, let's say, open source terms that are applicable to uh, different type of licenses as such. Um, so that that would be maybe something that I that I would highlight. I don't know whether you you agree, Carlos. Yep, yep, I totally agree. So um, this is this is a question that I believe you you already um, anticipated uh, in, in whether we need this type of of license. We are set, we were set in the context. Maybe you want to add something on that regard? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So I think, um, and it has, uh, what I am going to address now, it's something that has come as a feedback or even community critic. Um, so we use the this open and responsible AI license um, approach uh, to license Bloom. So basically the result of big science, Bloom is the large language model. Uh, and we promote, um, so the, within the big science community, but also at high in phase, we uh, promote uh, responsible AI licenses as we also promote open source licenses, Creative Commons licenses, et cetera, et cetera. So again, uh, what I want to say with this is that responsible AI licenses are not the only uh, a machine learning specific uh, tool to license uh, machine learning or AI, even though for the moment being, they are one of the few uh, av available out there on an open basis. We are currently exploring how um, a machine learning specific license could look could uh, look like under uh, the scope of uh, the open source, uh, uh, let's say, initiative or the open source definition. So, a fully open uh, licenses without any type of constraints. Could we use, for instance, a, temp a template such as the one from the MIT license or BSD license, very permissive and simple uh, license templates? to license, for instance, a machine or a pre-trained machine learning model by changing, I don't know, the tagging, either work referring to pre-trained model, right? These kind of things, maybe providing more uh, or new type of machine learning specific licenses uh, to your community uh, without also use uh, restrictions. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, sorry to interrupt you. I think it's also something uh, worth to name, something that, within the data sets space has already been happening for a few years now. Uh, we are starting to have now the debate for pre-trained models. For data specific licenses or data set specific licenses, as you may know, we are already we already have out there some kind of open uh, licensing templates such as the open knowledge foundation ones for an open uh, database rights uh, license. Also, the Linux Foundation have their own approach to a community distribution license agreement, the CDLA permissive and restrictive. So you see how the community has been trying to approach or tackle uh, the data set licensing challenge. And now we are asking ourselves how to license not just a training data set or a data set, but also a pre-trained or a machine learning model as such. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I fully agree. I fully agree with what I what I wanted to to sh to highlight is that as as we speak about AI um, as a broad concept and and, and as, as as composer of of different elements, um, this license may not be exclusive. Uh, it's not it's not exhaustive. Uh, in order to have all elements, uh, just we are talking about the model now. Or the pre-trained. In this case, we were talking about the pre-trained uh, um, 
model, but we may need to leverage on other type of licenses uh, for other elements that we need to to operate or to to implement the model. But I I fully agree with um, with you. The the problem that's that's also a big discussion about data um, and uh, whether it's useful or not, and whether all restrictions are foreseen. But because if if we have some now we we may be more focused on the intellectual property space with copyright, uh, which is to some extent um, harmonized uh, at a global level. When it comes to data, the I mean it's just mind blowing uh, because the 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 extent of fragmentation we have, which comes to to data, is not comparable to intellectual property, and then. When we want to find some standards that the standards that are implemented at the global level, then we have some some issues. Uh, in particular, when it, when it comes to non-personal data, because personal data, I mean, we know in most jurisdictions we have some some restrictions, uh, but when it comes to non-personal data, we have some public, uh, let's say, uh, um, initiatives to uh, leverage to to let's say um, leave data. For the for the public good, um, in the in the EU we have the uh, um, the um, reduce uh, the data reuse directive. Uh, uh, for instance, we will have we have the, the proposal on non personal data. For instance, um, applicable to the I mean the the, the data act uh, that we may discuss afterwards. So it is. I think it's, it's it's more complex, but I fully agree with um, with you. If if you agree, Carlos, we can we can we can move to uh, maybe to speak about which are the which is the the impact of the AI Act and the uh, uh, and the Liability Act. Also, we have um, as well the AI li Liability Directive. We have also the Data Act. I mean, there is a package of regulation, of regulations that, in my opinion, will have a huge impact. Uh, but um, not, 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 not also on 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 open source uh, as such, or on the wording, but also on the incentives that the developers will have to to use those uh, use those those. Um, those models as uh, for instance when it comes to liability so on and so forth but i want to hear from you uh what are your views maybe some general views on, on which are the the um the points that will that will that will be more impactful uh um when it comes to to the implementation of this this just this 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 huge package of of legislation yeah definitely uh, so I think that's a huge question, um, and it's nice that we are having or we are asking ourselves the question now, uh, because, for instance, the AI Act is going to enter into force in probably the first semester of 2025, so in two or three years term from now. So we have still have the time. Um, I think what this new uh, battery of uh, regulations from the EU side asks for so the AI Act, uh, the AI Liability Directive, or even the Effective Products Re Directive, and also, as you mentioned, the Data Act, is new types of licensing mechanisms in the market. Because what we have right now is not fit for what the regulations are asking or even promoting. Uh, when I say promoting, is within the Data Act. The Data Act is a specific regulatory mechanism um, promoted by the European Commission in order to even further consolidate or foster uh, data sharing, commercial data sharing related practices within uh, the EU market. And you might know it better than I, which types of specific legal provisions they are proposing uh, for stakeholders to even be sometimes forced or compelled, maybe better, uh, to license or share uh, their data, share, share their data. Now, when you are going to share the data either because you are compelled by the regulation or because a specific article tells you that you have to uh, license your data on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory conditions, you might want to look up something standardized and openly available out there that the market is already using. But 
we do not have this kind of licensing standards for the moment being within the market, not in data set related markets, nor AI specific markets. If we go to data markets, uh, also we know that under article, as we were uh, discussing you and I this morning, article 34, the commission basically is going to push to some kind of uh, standardized uh, model contractual agreements promoted and drafted under the auspices of the commission to be used or for everyone to be inspired by these kind of practices. Maybe this is a potential tool stemming, so let's say private governance tool, a license stemming from uh, a regulation. When uh, we go to the AI Act, um, it's different. With the AI Act, first of all, uh, for the moment being, uh, the Commission has, be, has been taking a very general and holistic approach to what's AI. It is defined as an AI system. However, as you uh, know, we have been uh, discussing here today all the time about this kind of componentization or component-based approach to AI. Uh, it's fine that we can tag something as an AI system. As an AI, an AI system potentially is envisioned as a commercial um, AI-related services such as a machine learning app provider under a software as a service uh, platform for sure. Um, but sometimes some um, stakeholders release on an open basis or just commercialize, not just an AI system as such, but some components such as the training data set, such as the pre-trained model. Is this an AI system under uh, the AI Act? We still don't know, right? And this might lead to legal uncertainty. This is something that should be tackled. Why? Because for instance, in the last proposal of the AI Act, uh, by the Czech presidency, there is a new article, Article 4, uh, tackling uh, or addressing general proposed AI systems. And basically, there is an exception, Article 4C. Under Article 4C, you might be able to provide or to commercialize a general proposed AI systems or even to release on an open basis a general proposed AI systems if and only if you make sure to disclaim and also, of course, to forbid users to use uh, these general purpose AI systems for any of the specified high risk scenarios. So if I want to open source a general purpose AI system, meaning for instance, in this case, because we have no interpretation guidelines, a large language model, if I want to open source a large language model under let's say an open source license, can I under the AI Act assist right now? No, full stop, you cannot. You have to place some use restrictions. So if you want to release on an open basis these kind of components of the AI system, because it's, I don't know, your business model, then you have to start thinking about new licensing paradigms because the open source one doesn't serve you anymore. Maybe you have to think about some kind of open approach or releasing on a royalty free and flexible basis, uh, the large language model or the tool or the AI specific tool. However, placing some use restriction. These use restrictions should mirror the high risk specified scenarios within the AI Act. Plus then you will have, uh, of course, the challenge of enforcing uh, this specific license for potential misusers or companies that are using or allegedly using uh, the AI system or component within one of these high risk uh, scenarios. And ca I can also even go uh, about how this can uh, be articulated with uh, with the AI liability directive, but maybe I stop now because I know you have also your 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 criterion on this. <laughs> I will I will be brief. Um, I think the um, I mean the the rationale of this whole set of measures. We have a set of uh, measures that are kind of consumer protective and that are thinking that which will be the the um, the the effects on the market on the, I mean, the, the final product will cause in the market. And I think that's very much the purpose of the AI Act. I mean, they are, they were thinking, I mean, with they, it was kind of the, the first text uh, dealing with AI in um, like uh, um, published by the European Commission to have legal effects and to deploy kind of, to change the whole thing. Um, my my impression is that it went out of hand and and it, it they they that's my my personal view um they kind of didn't foresee the relevance and the fragmentation of the industry and that's that's something and and also the the different stages of the supply chain 
So when it comes to licensing, I I, I understand and they, that AA system, they, as I inter my reasonable interpretation would be that it only applies to the final product that is put into the market, to the, to the, to the assembled product, to the AI app, uh, or to the medical device embedding some AI features. I think that's that's the thing that the um, the um, the regulator had in mind, or at least that that's what for me makes sense. Applying the AI Act to the whole supply chain and to every sector and causing an impact on licensing as such, um, for me is is not is wouldn't be reasonable at all, or at least the the assessments or the, the legislative assessments I have seen don't show that is the willingness of the of the regulator. But that's that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, I was anticipating. Um, I think um, the um, the rules on liability uh, don't help that much. Uh, and in particular, the presumptions that are established under the um, AA Liability Act don't help that much to uh, implement this type of, um, of, of, of open systems because you need to actually document and be accountable for and be able to evidence a lot of things that we're trying to kind of um, um, flexibilize, so to speak, with, the, with open source uh, models. So, um, if I'm just using, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of um, developing and um, a software or innovating uh, in an open manner, it's just because I want to do it faster. I want to do it in a flexible way. I want to incorporate contribution from other sources. Then if I have to evidence that, a contribution from another source that it may be, it may be key uh, uh, for my model is done in a particular way and the burden of proof is on my roof, not on the victim roof, then I may have a problem. And that may be kind of a, a hurdle for the, for, the, uh, for the open, let's say, source system to, to, um, to be implemented or be perceived as uh as as a as a um as a hurdle but um i want to I, I wouldn't like to um maybe if you have some final comments carlos otherwise i would open the floor for questions uh we, we have since we have some seven time seven minutes left yeah definitely i i so i i could uh, keep going with open source and we didn't touch even regulatory sandboxes or or the AA liability directive and the AA act articulation but yes please uh, let's Let's have some questions, and if not, I can keep going. <laughs> Hi, everybody. There is a question coming in, and I'm going to read it to you. But before, I have my question. Um, so, concretely, I am an SME in Europe, and I would like to do AN Health and um, AI licensing. How do you help me? Um, I'm gonna take this one. Yeah, yeah. So I basically, I mean, I am an in-house counsel for a company, so I couldn't, let's say, help you. Uh, another thing would be how these licenses can help you. Uh, these licenses are available under and promoted also under the rail uh, initiative. So basically, if uh, you want to release one of your AI specific features with uh, your license, of course, or, I mean, with these kind of licenses, such as responsible AI licenses or open and responsible AI licenses, you can already. If uh, you are more interested uh, in uh, basically taking a more customized approach and be inspired by these kind of AI specific licenses. But for instance, you want to release everything really on an open basis. You don't want yes. to put any use restrictions. Yes, of course, you can take the license, take out the use restrictions and use the license on an even more uh, permissive approach. You can uh, do this. So these license, let's say, this type of licenses we design, for instance, under Big Science, so uh, the Bloom Right license or the Big Science Open Right license, 
are not some kind of proprietary material. So you can take it, you can modify it, you can do whatever we want with it. At Hacking Face, we do not provide any consulting services with regards to the license. We are just the GitHub of machine learning. So we are an open intermediary platform. Uh, and uh, when users upload their pre-trained models or their data set to our platform, they are free, of course, to choose whatever licensing mechanism they want because we cannot say how they should uh, license their own uh, features. Okay, great. So now let me quickly, the audience has questions. Monica, hi Monica, thank you. Uh, where can I find some machine learning artifacts license templates? Yeah, uh, you can find them under the rail initiative, www.licenses.ai. Uh, within, uh, I think for, you can go to blogs, and within blog, uh, we have two articles. Uh, one of them dealing with uh, the release, the Big Science Open Rail M uh, license. So this is a license template that you can already uh, use for this purpose. Also, you have already some other uh, machine learning applications, such as Stable Diffusion. Uh, for Stable Diffusion, they place the license called the Creative ML. Creative ML Open RIL uh, license, and you see that it is a general license. So this license could be applicable also to other types of machine learning models. So you can also, if you want, uh, use this type of uh, of license. So yeah, I can even provide afterwards to you, Carmen, some links if you want to share with the audience. And also send me. You all have my email out there. If you need, uh, I can. No? Send yeah, me questions, I distribute it to the speakers. Yeah, and cool. last question, Miguel Bustamante, Fuentes. It seems that an AI developer loses some leverage towards their main competitors when they open source parts of their technology. I mean, you basically... <laughs> My That's question it? is, oh, that, do okay. they focus on keeping for themselves the core parts of their technology while profiting out of the licenses or of less important features? Or can we say that the developer bet to have a strong marketing program in order to be the most demanded provider by the public? Did you yeah. get that? Yeah, definitely. So I think it's uh, so it's one thing that uh, it hasn't uh, to do just with uh, specifically with uh, um, AI specific features. It's basically part of the competition dynamics within open source applications. Um, a recent or a very nice example is uh, basically to ask uh, which are the most used machine learning frameworks nowadays. TensorFlow, PyTorch, two of them. TensorFlow from Google, PyTorch from Meta. Both of them yes. open source on a very permissive basis. Why? Because you're interested in this case to attract a critical mass of users. Yes. Once your users are going to be use, using this type of tooling released on an open basis, and even more, uh, they are becoming dependent on this type of infrastructure, very expensive infrastructure that they couldn't develop from scratch uh, for sure then you can play some kind of a start offering some kind of premium or collateral related services. Hey, do you need more cloud? Hey, do you need more data storage? Et cetera, et cetera. So this is how you can also not just monetize uh, or indirectly monetize the investment on openly, as Miguel was saying, right? He's saying openly releasing, right? Um, on an open source basis, your technology, so your specific uh, knowledge, but also it's a competitive leverage for you because by openly releasing something and even being the first one releasing this very specific tool, you know that you might benefit from first mover advantages in the market and benefit from more market traction than your potential competitors. If, cool. if, I'm, if I may, if, <laughs> if, 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 if I may just, I will, I will add, add, add something. And actually, it depends heavily on your business model. I mean, I think uh, open source is not for all business models, uh, and it depends on the way you innovate as well. Um, some companies, uh, because you, I mean, inevitably you lose some control when when you uh, open source and when you use open source repositories and libraries and so on. So it, it, it depends on, on whether you manage to properly individualize the, let's say, elements or the features you're 
open sourcing uh, uh, and, and, and those that you can keep proprietary because you develop yourself without um, any, let's say, public library um, and so on. So I think, I think that's, that's the main thing. Uh, there is no good or bad. For sure, uh, open source is a very good thing because it helps to, let's say, a streamlined process and it helps to, uh, it, it created kind of a, a new ecosystem uh, that before it, it wasn't, it just wasn't. So if you want, if you provide, let's say, ancillary services, uh, it may help you a lot. If your, if your core service or your core product is the technology as such, then I, I would carefully, as, carefully assess whether to use uh, open source to develop that or not, or, as, or at least to evaluate which aspects on, uh, within that, that technology are developed using, uh, using uh, open source. Yep, I agree. No. My dears, and the time is up. <laughs> the show is up and the light is going bad. Um, so thank you for being here, Carlos and Ruben. And uh, as always, I will send you the uh, recording first if it's fine for you. We will publish it on the AI Cafe channels. Thank you for being there. It was totally exciting and um, and I think knowledge is being shared in the European AI community. Thank you very much and bye bye. Now have a nice day. Thank you so bye -bye. much. Take care. Ciao. You too. Thank Ciao. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.